Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us as always, and welcome. Uh, I am Jeff Boccaccio, and uh, I am a member of the STA board. Uh, and one of my responsibilities is the really fun one, which is organizing events like this. Uh, and uh, and so tonight's conversation is with Dr. Ken Long, uh, who I am super excited about having a chat to. Um, but if you will just allow me a minute before we get into it, I'd like to tell you a little bit about something a bit new and different for the STA that we're doing in April. Some of you may have seen this come up on email or social media, but it's a one day conference, which is uh, which we're hosting and it's called uh, technicals to trading systems. And the whole idea here is that we're trying to make it a uh, a way to kind of move the needle of technical analysis just a little bit more to the to the quantitative systematic side. And so we are getting a host of um, of quite cool speakers along uh, of the likes of uh, Perry Kaufman, who's going to join us. He's doing a bit of a master class. Uh, Rob Carver. Uh, we've got Jessica Jones. We've got we've got loads of good speakers, and I would encourage everybody to have a look at that. Um, it's going to be an in-person event, but it's also going to be delivered via Zoom. So it's a hybrid event, and it's going to happen right in one more gate place, the usual spot for our normal in-person STA meetings. Um, and it's cheap. It's like 200 pounds if you're a member. Um, and, the, and, and if you're not a member, you might as well join as a member, and that makes your membership about 25 quid. So um, I would encourage everybody to, to check that out. Um, and specifically, it's on the 18th of April, and um, you can find details of that on the STA website at uh, technicalanalysts.com. So now let me get on to the main event here, because uh, tonight we are continuing our STA international tour uh, and the Ask the Expert series. And tonight is with Dr. Ken Long, who I've been trying to get talking to us at the STA for quite some time and finally managed to uh, to twist his arm. So welcome, Ken. Uh, great to be here, Jeff. Uh, go easy on that shoulder. Huh? <laughs> um, so uh, like I said, I've been pestering Ken for a while. Um, now, let me, I'll, I'm, Ken, I'm going to give you a brief introduction uh, just for the people that don't know. Um, and, and then I'm going to ask you to maybe just fill it out a little bit with uh, with maybe what makes the most sense for you. Um, but so Ken has got a, a a decorated career in in a few different areas. And in one way, he is the associate professor at the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. This is at Leavenworth, Texas, and I've had the honor of being in Leavenworth, Texas, with him um, because he runs. Uh, research weekends for for traders occasionally. Um, uh, he's based there, of course, himself, and so he makes everybody come to him. Um, but there's a, there's a large army base there at Fort Leavenworth, and he's also a retired lieutenant colonel uh, after 25 years in active service. service. Um, and he also has a, a plethora of academia behind him. So he is an adjunct professor at Colorado Tech in the doctoral program uh, for organizational development, and he's also an adjunct professor, City University in Seattle, and in, in the MBA program there. Now, if I were to summarize a bit of a bit of all of that, um, and can correct me if I'm wrong here, but if I were to try to put a, a, a label on what you're doing with the with the Army College there these days, it's essentially training up the the leaders of the future in strategy, um, creativity, uh, amongst, amongst other things. How close to the mark am I there? Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, pr that's pretty close. Uh, I, I would say we are, we are positioned, uh, to teach these guys at the 10 year of service mark. So typically, you know, if they're any good, they're going to have a career of 20 to 30 years, um, at positions of increasing responsibility. And so we're positioned right at that 10 year mark in their career where everybody who was going to get out to do other things has sort of gotten out. And these are, these are officers that have been direct action leaders, usually in combat, small unit, uh, hands-on. 
and are making a transition to organizational leadership where they have to work with large organizations and policies and um, delayed effects and large resources and um, uh, long-term plans. And so we're helping them transition to the world of taking a genuinely large strategic view, but also learning how to convert that into actionable systems and policies that guys like them used to have to execute. So they're that they're that in between person who has to take words on a page and ideas in their head and turn it into something that a bunch of monkeys like me can implement in the world. So um, I I focus on uh, uh, logistics, but also change management, uh, leadership ethics, uh, systems thinking, and lately uh, creativity, uh, because we're recognizing that that's the area where we need the most work is that in a dynamic world, you got to have leaders that not only are experts of process and can lead teams to do routine things routinely, but you got to have a creative spark that is well integrated into your worldview. Like you don't want creativity when it's the last gasp. You want it, you want those new ideas before you need them. And so trying to integrate creativity in a world where uh, we're concerned about doctrine and procedure and routine, getting that balance right is, is crucial. And that's sort of what I've been focusing on the last 20, 20 years here. Over. So I hear, I hear a lot of overlaps, um, but, but some people might think it's a big jump to go from, yeah. uh, from, from sort of working in the Army and lecturing in the Army after having retired from active service uh, and, and then, and then into, do, into the trading side. So I'm hearing risk management, I'm hearing systems thinking, I'm hearing creativity. But uh, you know, what I'm curious about a little bit is um, how and when did you start to make well, how and when did you start getting involved with markets and start exploring that further? Yeah. Well, you know, to be honest, when I when I first came into the army in 1980, uh, you were still a gleam in your father's eye. Uh, <laughs> I was making 400 bucks a month, and I went on uh, parachute status because they would pay you another 120 bucks a month to jump out of a perfectly good airplane, and that was a 20 percent, 25 percent boost in monthly pay. And, uh, you know, my dad told me a lot of things and of the few that I remember, he said, you know, make, start, start paying yourself for the future when you retire. And so I started uh, investing in 1980. And then when I got married in 86, my, uh, my wife's father uh, is, uh, had come from the Chinese mainland in 1949, left the uh, communists behind and that clan came over so he, and he's an entrepreneur and he looked at what i was doing he said mutual funds what are you doing you need to get into the game and so i started you know i wanted to hold my own at the table and so i started reading and uh looking at trading and and starting to um add that skill uh to my to my repertoire as a as an active duty uh, officer you know there were there were there were times when I could trade other, most of the time I couldn't. So I started looking at long-term systems and then slowly began, you know, bringing the same, I think, practical risk averse decision-making under uncertainty that you get in the army uh, to the trading profession. He said, you know, it, it really is not a big difference when, when it comes right down to it, the types of decisions you make, the pressures that you feel, the competing time frames, lots of good ideas, which one am I going to pick? Plenty of bad ideas when I don't want to get those. So learning how to put those into action really has, uh, has been a mutual interest in both sides, both the Army profession and in the trading profession. There's, I would say there's a 90% overlap in decision making, if I'm being honest. Um, and so there's a natural, a natural alignment. It, the, the better I get at one, the better I get at the other. And uh, that's been a, um, that's been true for almost 45 years now. Over. Yeah. I mean, it's, well, I don't know. It's, it's, it's impressive. I didn't, I didn't know that it was actually the father-in-law that gave you the sort of kick up the butt to, uh, to really yeah. kind of start, start competing with him maybe in the field and then, uh, and then applying the skills. That's good. That's good to hear. Yeah. Well, he was a real gunslinger uh, and rest in peace to Steve Lee who brought a wonderful family 
to America and was a salt of the earth kind of guy. We just, uh, we, he just passed on last year and uh, I'm so fond of that guy. He really pushed me harder than almost anybody else to uh, not to be wasting my time. Uh, and so I great fondness for my father-in-law. Very good. Okay. So I, I'm going to have to jump into um, to so how true. I know you because um, yeah. uh, you know, people, people who've been watching this, they would have heard me talk about you um, or on the alpha mind podcast or on, on various things in the past. And yeah. um, so, you know, for me, it's super exciting to be able to do a one-on-one -on -one like this, you know, like, like we've been able to do with, you know, Larry Williams and John Bollinger, uh, Perry Kaufman, um, and so it's kind of like, you know, meeting, uh, even though, of course, we, I, we know each other quite well, but, you know, it's, it's meeting somebody who we've got the utmost respect for and admiration. And so what what I'm curious about to hear about you is that so what, what traders or what what guys were did, did you have? Which, what guys did you look up to at that time when you started yeah. getting involved? Well, uh my first exposure to starting to read the literature uh, found me um, with the can slim method. So that's uh, yeah. William O'Neill and uh, Peter Lynch was a large name. You couldn't Google or whatever Google was back then. It wasn't even Google. Uh, th those guys really kind of dominated. The can slim was a very systematic growth oriented uh, trend following and mechanical in the sense that you could have very precise uh, rules. And then um, uh, the ideas of Peter Lynch with the uh, trade or own what you know, and use that as an important guide. Uh, so those were those were important. Uh, that's like uh, late 80s. Uh, then um, somehow, I was in a bookstore and waiting for my wife. And I, I saw the Van Tharp's book on um, trade your way to financial freedom. And I said, well, let me kill Another some one. time. I started reading and, and, you know, two hours later, she comes and finds me and says, let's go. And I found that his combination of psychology, statistics, and finding your edge and personalizing it really resonated with me a lot. And, and then from there, I would just say I was very eclectic in, uh, in my reading, but it was kind of always practitioner based um, guys that had survived contact with the market for years and had longevity and endurance and, you know, the old wise men. Uh, and so um, Alexander Elder, uh, Brett Steenbarger, um, you know, professionals in, in the field that um, that had had been down been down that road a few times, uh, very practical oriented. So I, I would say um, that's that's where most of my influence. I, let me also just say Nick Darvis. And I read this before, I think when I was in high school and I didn't realize it until much later, how I made $2 million in the stock market and the you know, creator of the Darvis box, the, you know, international dancer and who was, you know, trading by telegram and newspaper. So that's, but his, his approach uh, to independent thinking and evaluation and systemic testing really resonated with me and and it is a part of the way i look at the markets uh consistently now is that uh, sort of the darvis box um approach so i would say that's another big influence excellent can i ask you can i ask you a quick question um i got a note from massimo sure. saying that my webcam is looking like i got horizontal lines in it or something do you see that or does it look okay no it looks okay to me mine is a little fuzzy too but i mean Neither one of us are much to look at, if I'm being honest. Uh, if it sounds okay, we should be okay. <laughs> well, we'll carry on then. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so, you know, it's um, so, okay. So, round about 99, I'm finishing off your bio like really slow form here. Right about 99, yeah. you founded Tortoise yeah, yeah. Capital, Tortoise Capital Management. And this is after you know, clearly having read Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom from Van Tharp, and then and then somehow you managed to meet him, I'm presuming maybe go into one of his courses or something. Is that how it worked? Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd been trading and I was a captain in the army and I had made some money and I said, I'd read his book and I saw, well, he offers a, this workshop on systems, systems trading development or trading system development. 
uh, with Chuck LeBeau and uh, Chuck Whitman. And I said, well, let me spend a couple grand. That's a lot of money to a captain in the Army. It's a lot of money today. I said, let me go there and see what was up with it. And I took his home study course just to see what I was going to get into. And I was really hooked on that systematic approach because by that time, I just completed a master's in uh, systems management from USC, that man-machine interface and procedural thinking. And I had grown up in a statistical process control world of manufacturing. So I was, I was good on quality control and stats and math and all that stuff. So I went there and I showed him what I was doing. And he says, step one, get incorporated, become a business. And that was the best, I, the best advice I'd ever gotten in order to turn it into a business and regularize, um, you know, the, the process and, and uh, treat it strictly as a business. Uh, let me, I'm going to try to adjust the, uh, the camera so we get some of the glare off. So um, that sort of began the, a, a long-term relationship with, uh, with Tharp. And um, I, you know, I, I went to a workshop, he interviewed me. I was a guest speaker a couple times. He invited me to teach a course that became multiple courses. And I think that's probably how we ended up in each other's orbit was uh, just a natural progression of learn a little, teach a little and, uh, and keep growing in that way. Over. That's right. Yeah. So for, you know, for, for everybody watching, um, so I, I was introduced to, to, to Ken, um, I don't remember the, the exact year, but it was many moons ago. 2009. 2009. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, <laughs> that was, uh, and I remember specifically cause I went to do a, a course at, at VTI, the Van Tharp Institute there. And it was, uh, the systematic trading course. It was essentially systems design, uh, which is, yeah. you know, right down my street, right down your street. And then from, from talking to you and, and hearing you then I was hooked. And then I was introduced to, uh, to the rest of your, um, your sort of study and coursework at the time, right. Which is, uh, which is extensive. And so for anybody who isn't familiar with Ken, um, have a have a little look on Google or YouTube for just Ken Long or Ken Long Tortoise Capital, and uh, you'll find a plethora of um, information and just video after video that are available that he puts out. Um, in in Ken's words, because I'll use his own words here, there's a lot of gold in that mine. <laughs> so <laughs> you can uh, there's there's an awful lot of of useful information in there that is just made available for for everybody. And then of course he's got various other courses and he's got a Patreon site where he's he's, he's I don't understand how Ken is able to do so much with his time because he's got the same amount of time as as everybody else. But every day he is um, updating markets. Um, putting together podcasts for for some of the guys that follow his work, um, and uh, and and just doing the thing, and uh, so it's it's a, it's an impressive amount of uh, content and and a impressive amount of quality of content in there as well. So, uh, and I don't mean to toot your own horn. I just want to make I want to bring people's attention to it. Um, now, it, you know, in your bio, you call yourself a I quite like this, by the way, the systematic trader with discretionary tendencies and multiple time frames. Yeah. So could you yeah. could you expand on that a little bit for us? Sure. Well, you know, there is the world in in the world of research, there's practitioners that do things with their hands. And then there's uh, scholars or um, theoreticians that are in the world of their mind. In the middle, you meet to find practitioner scholars. And so when I look at the when I look at the markets, it was, you know, what I've learned. And I so everything I'm saying is, you know, filtered through my experience, obviously. No universal truths here, except that uh, most people fail because they're not systematic, because they allow their evolutionary brain to overwhelm them and act on fear and greed. And so that the longest term edges come from those who are systematic by nature, because that you automatically are on the other side of the trade from the herd, if you can be systematic. Now, my personal opinion is you can go too far down that pathway and become wedded to the system itself, or you have to make it so elaborate and Baroque to account for all of the twists and turns of the market and the exceptions that you end up getting a system that is not robust. It's too, too complex. So I, I start with uh, 
a statistical framework that I believe gives me an edge. And then within the framework uh, of that scaffolding, there are certain places where my discretion as an experienced trader give me an edge. And so I have tendencies to do that. And, and what I explore is um, when, I have a, when I have an urge to do something, I study it and see where it came from, see how it works out, put some stats on it to see if that insight actually does lead to a persistent edge or not. So I respect those little uh, glimpses behind the curtain sometimes into intuition. And, um, but, but it starts with an anchoring in, in process and systems. And, um, but the discretionary tendencies are there because I, what I've learned is if I don't respect those, if I don't find a way to exercise those, uh, then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to blow myself up because I'm resisting my natural urges. So I've got to have a way to account for that, to find new edges, but also keep that under control with some scaffolding. So that's, that's what I would, that's the long answer on that one. Eh? Yeah, no, it's a, uh, no, that makes a lot of sense. It's, um, it's interesting. And I, 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 it's hard for me in a way, because I know so much of your, of your work to pick what we ought to talk yeah. about here. And it's, um, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm bearing in mind the audience, we've got, you know, mainly technical sure. analysts and fund managers, and some, we're going to want right. to dive into some of the technical stuff. So maybe this is a good, a good point to yeah. do that. Um, one, one of the things that you, that you're, one of the things you're known for is putting together the lens, right? The, the, a, a specific lens, or actually, of course, you've got multiple lenses. One of them is RLCO. Uh, one of them is RLFF. Uh, and of course our audience who may not be familiar with your work may not know what those are, but these are statistically, um, statistically based frameworks and thinking about RLCO here where, you know, we're basically putting um, that bit of scaffold around the market and it allows you to frame risk rewards. And people may not know what frame yeah. means. And I was wondering if maybe you could talk through sure. how, how you sort of approach that. And, um, and then yeah. I also want to talk about RLs versus moving averages at some point, but that's for sure. a follow-up. Yeah. So briefly, the, the idea of a frame comes from the world of cognitive science and cognitive mm -hmm. research. These are handy tools that we use to structure our thinking in a complex world. It allows you to simplify it enough to take effective action. The same way that a master mason uses scaffolding to protect him at height and also to organize his work so he can be very efficient. So a frame turns out to be a, a lens through which you look at the market, make sense of it, propose risk and reward, take actions, and it's all within this uh, logical construct uh, that gives you uh, just enough structure to be able to work with. It gives you some grounding. So uh, to, I want to move into the regression line. So one of the things we, you and I have worked on with a long time uh, is the importance of connecting everything we do to price action. Well, the short story on this is that when I was studying moving averages, it made sense to me that the regression line, which is the best description of a data set, you know, it's the one that has the least amount of error in the fat tails. So regression line was the best way to express the trend of price. If you look at the last little dot on a regression line, if you put it on that last price bar, the end point of that line is what you would think of as the rational price or the perfect price that is predicted by the all the previous price action. And you could think of the the candle that it's on or the bar, everything that's north or south of that is sort of the error or the noise. So the insight was that if you use a moving regression line or a least squares moving average, what you have is you're continuously plotting that last point and then connect the dots and it looks like a moving average, but it's based on regression. And that turns out to be much more adaptive than simple moving averages or some of the other weighted versions of it. And it was a sufficient, it was a sufficient edge over simple moving averages that I was then able to start using that in lieu of. When I combine a fast and a slow, we can now start thinking of early warnings, then a turning point, then an early warning of the next leg or next direction. 
So now uh, we can start adapting to changes in price action much quicker. Now you, you just got to pick the slow and the fast pair that makes sense within the time frame that you want to work. Well, it turned out that the relationship that we saw in one time frame held for all the other time frames because the nature regression lines is to adapt quickly to data. So we began developing a fractal point of view so that we could have a standard frame that, and interpret price action uh, systematically, consistently, but in a way that was adaptive to changes in price. And now that simplifies the way that you look at the market, whether you're looking at one minute, 10 minute, one month or whatever. If you have a standard lens to make sense of the market, you now can be systematic and disciplined. So we started uh, developing that approach to uh, rapidly assessing the situation and then determining if we had an actionable trade inside that frame of reference. Um, the regression line fractal framework was an extension of that where we started looking at simultaneously four regression lines from significantly different time frames, 10, 30, 90, and 270. And we started using that as a proxy for price uh, for the short-term regression line or uh, long-term holders, fair value. What a long-term holder might say is this would be fair value. So we just use those definitions and now we can compare the most aggressive of traders and the price versus what we consider to be the long-term fair value. And then measuring that distance over time, we begin to understand some of the price dynamics uh, of that instrument. When those two prices, when, when the 10 period regression line and the 270 are both identical. Now suddenly both of those two populations agree that that's the correct price. Well, that'll stay like that until the traders start moving it. Well, how far can they move it? You can start studying the maximum favorable or adverse excursion that the 10 period makes from the 270 and start describing that statistically. So you start finding out over the life cycle of that instrument, what is the uh, average move, what is the standard deviation, what is the normal and abnormal moves, and you can start calibrating your estimate of what reasonable moves might look like to determine if you have a tradable moment. Uh, and so we call it a fractal framework because it turns out that the interpretation of these relationships is identical in every time frame. So you're always looking at the market through a point of consistency and discipline and uh, being systematic. So uh, a, that's what I would say, you know, we asked me before about a, a uh, systematic trader with discretionary tendencies. I start with that framework first and then look for ways like a monkey to play with the, within the space that it protects me with. Over. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, <clears throat> just for the audience as well. So I, I guess the, the RLFF framework, the one that you were talking about where you've got four moving regression lines of different look back periods, right? That's where you're getting the different yeah. time frames from, but you were able to look at that through a single, say maybe chart time frame lens. So it could just be a daily time right. frame, but now exactly. you're getting four different sort of like look back periods where exactly. and then seeing where they where they intersect. Yeah. So I use a factor of three to scale that arbitrarily, but it turns out to be pretty good. <clears throat> so I start with the 10 period regression line, multiply that by three, that gives me the 30. So in that pair of 10 and 30, I have a fast one and a slow one, and they are related by a factor of three. And then I take the 30, multiply that by three and give me a 90. Now that middle pair has a 30 and a 90. One's fast and one's slow. It, when, you, when you chart all of those on your, uh, on your time frame of choice, it turns out that when you see the 30, 90 on that chart, you're looking at the 10, 30 on the higher time frame. So instead of having to switch back and forth between time frames, you can actually have all that information uh, uh, synthesized into one and in one common operating picture, we would call that in, in the army. And then the same thing with the 270. You take that 90 by three, you get 270. The extra insight was that the 10 period regression line, which is the fast member of the fast pair, we just we set that equal to price. We just say, 
we're going to treat that as the trader's price and all of the you know the uh, the tails of the bar or candle is just noise right and then the 270 we say hey that's the long-term fair value of the long-term buy and holders relatively the difference between those two positions on the chart is the difference between what a trader thinks the price is and what a long-term holder thinks is fair value when those are widely different you can start looking at that space in between i could sometimes i make that atr boxes how many atrs between the trader's price and the fair value and i can now start framing that reward to risk in a price ladder and now i can start structuring trades and that works on every time frame uh, that we've tested from you know a minute chart to monthly charts over yeah, so I mean, that's, that seems to be leading us right into critical states in a way, right? Which I know I wanted to dive into because that's, you know, one one thing that I think gets missed a lot is, um, you know, you can have a a simple trading system that may um, that may you implement it on whatever the time frame might be, um, but sometimes, you know, you you want to you. Let me rephrase what what I what I see you doing an awful lot of the time is some specific target selection to try to figure out where yeah. is your attention best served where where are you likely to see an outsized move and yeah. so by looking statistically at those areas where you're either seeing a really big stretch say of that that 10 away from say 270 is fair value now you're looking for okay well this is maybe a good spot for a reversion or you've got the spot where you know everything is kind of squeezed in a little bit so could you talk to us a little bit about critical states sure. and how you use those to um yeah. to, to target select yeah i think of a critical state as a moment <laughs> when the instrument or the target i like to think of as a target my sniper training uh, i think of the target is in a critical state when it is there is a higher than normal possibility of a greater than normal move in either direction so the thing is ready to pop i, I want you to think of uh popcorn microwave popcorn uh, that's been in the microwave for for 40 seconds uh, at 45 seconds it's going to start popping so what i'd like to know what i'd like to buy is an opportunity to trade something that's been in the microwave for 40 seconds. It looks just like another bag of popcorn. You have to analyze it to determine how much energy is built up inside that. Once it starts popping, off it goes, and then it behaves like popcorn that is that is popping or is in play. So I like looking for things that are just about ready to be in play. Yeah. Uh, and that's what a critical state might be. Well, I want a compound critical state, and here's and here's why. We typically find time frames that work for us for making decisions for trading, and we get used to looking through that lens. Maybe it's a daily chart, maybe it's an hourly chart, and so we get used to interpreting all market information through that lens, and we forget that ninety-five percent of the world isn't looking through that lens, and they're making their decisions on their time frames. And so when those guys start getting active, now suddenly we get surprised by the price moving. Well, that was not normal. And so we, and then we try to come up with a rule from our chart that makes sense of that. When in fact, it just was somebody on another time frame with a bag of money makes a move that makes sense on their time frame. So we use the idea of a compound critical state to find symbols that have multiple demographics of different kinds of traders. I would like to have a symbol where the long-term buy and holder is coming to a moment where he's under tension, emotional stress, and he has to either buy or sell. He's much more inclined to make a big move with emotion, and that can go in any direction. Now, if the long-term buy and holder and a swing trader and a um, a, a, a slow day trader, a fast day trader. If all of these independent piles of traders are all looking at their time frame and they see a critical state, and all it takes is price to move through 50 to 51 or whatever it may be, and that causes each one of those guys like popcorn to start popping, now suddenly they're all surprised by the fact that we've got an abnormal price move. 
So it's my contention that we can identify through location and volatility the conditions that lead to a compound critical state. For me, trade location is simply where inside that Darvis box. You pick your look back period. And if this thing is getting close to an extreme on a given look back period, then those guys are either ready to play the breakout with emotion or to preserve their gains and start reversing. But as it approaches, the, as the train is approaching the station, something's going to happen. And I just don't know which direction. Well, if you stack up all of these different look back periods and they're all approaching that critical state, now when it does trigger big moves. The same with volatility. We can classify it as abnormally quiet, abnormally volatile, or that fat piece in the middle. I only really care about abnormally volatile or abnormally uh, quiet. Because right. each one of those creates conditions where it could be like abnormally volatile. That thing's already in play. There is emotion running rampant. So if you had compound location and active volatility, the thing is a runaway train and get on board and figure out how you're going to trade it within a framework. Conversely, if you're an abnormally quiet, that's like being next to a pond at night, very, very quiet, and somebody throws a stone in there it magnifies the sound and then the herd gets spooked and they start their running. So I like both of those extremes of volatility, either extremely quiet or extremely volatile. And if I can combine those and then look at a large enough population, I should have some steady stream of candidates that are ready for me to trade over some given period of time. So I get lots of opportunities. I have typical holding periods routine patterns, and I can now just cycle through the candidates that come in through those screens. Uh, and then by adopting maybe non-standard approaches to classifying location and volatility, then we're getting a unique insight into uh, the market that maybe is not widely seen. Although to be honest, there's times when I look at uh, prices approaching the 200-day moving average. Well, everybody knows that, and everybody is ready for it to blast through or to reject and that makes that a critical state in in that sense when you start compounding from different time frames now you have something that is just ready to start going and then the momentum feeds on itself and then uh, we as we like to say lather rinse repeat just i want to turn that into a production system like a manufacturer i'm a i'm a manufacturing process guy i want a reliable brick making machine that just makes bricks the same way all the time stacks them on a pallet moves the pallet to the warehouse uh, you know for for a rainy day that's that in a nutshell is my systematic nature my statistical nature coming through uh for the for most of my my viewpoints over lots of good stuff in there um one of, one of the things that i really wanted to highlight by talking to you today is the statistical approach that you take to pretty much everything. Um, and so it's, can you wrap a statistical framework around whatever it is that you're looking at? And that's one of the things that I, I learned from you sort of early on and, yeah. and use to this day. And, you know, the, one of those comes down to say market classification as well. So you mentioned like say a 200 day moving average and to, yeah. to, for the audience, um, just to clarify, even though you are somewhat agnostic, you tend to play mainly within U.S. stocks and ETFs, right? Yeah, that's fair. I, I you know, the uh, the ETFs I trade are global in nature because I want to be exposed to uh, large, liquid, uh, frequently traded instruments that reduce the spread, but also have sort of a continuous signal that are always in play so that there's always a market, so that I'm getting constant update of information. So that means that I'm not really paying attention to small caps and even mid caps or some thinly traded instruments because I need the law of large numbers in order to be able to sensibly apply uh, statistics. And, and I'm using statistics in a, in a descriptive sense, a very first order use of them. I simply want to know for the like when you and I are looking at your equity curve, we'd like to look at your last 30 trades and find the expectancy 
of those trades and then put statistics on it to determine how is that population working? Is the slope better than it was in the last? Set? So simply by finding averages and, and the range of normal plus or one standard plus or minus one standard deviation, we can generally find what normal means so that we can really concentrate on abnormal. So you get a price move that's moved beyond one standard deviation of the normal. Yeah. Now suddenly that's in play. It's either going to go crazy or it's going to revert back to the mean. And that's what creates that uh, uh, critical state. So I don't have a directional bias. What I have is almost like a options trader who's doing straddles. So when it comes to that critical state, it's ready to break. I'll, I'm just following price because I know that the probability of a large move is greater now than ever. And then that that covers a lot of, uh, you know, when I get the direction wrong once or twice, it doesn't matter. Just keep shooting. So that's that's my general approach to statistics is descriptive and not not trying to overfit and over predict, but simply describe states of nature. Over. So that seems like a, a, a nice little segue. Maybe if you wouldn't mind talking about frog boxes, because Sure. Um, that is a way of maybe taking this, all of those compound critical states, those areas that you found. Yeah. And if you're looking at it, maybe through the intraday lens, which is primarily what the frog box was, was, was designed for. Um, yeah. but it's also got a, yeah. anyway, let me, let me let you talk about frog boxes and then we can discuss that a little sure. bit more. So, so the main idea of, um, of intraday trading was that I don't think you can really try to make too much sense of it. All you can do is sort of respond to those forces that are pushing things around. So the idea of a frog box was the idea that when you start approaching a frog at a pond, he's going to let you get to a certain distance and he's cool. And as soon as you cross that line, he triggers into action and you can't catch him. He goes from absolute peace and quiet to explosive move out of your range. And we saw a lot of cases where prices would move in that way. They would move certain distances and there was a certain region in which uh, there was some safety. So we started taking a look at the variability of intraday moves, finding the size of daily ranges and use some descriptive statistics to distinguish between signal and noise. What we wanted to say was, how far does this thing have to move off the low of the day before we can say that is a signal or is it still within the noise box? So the idea of the frog box was simply to try to describe the size of that signal versus noise. And then if we express the average intraday range as a function of that box, we could determine if we had enough regular volatility to trade intraday. And it would tell you what the size of that management box would be. How much risk can I afford to take and still have two or three to one intraday? So without going off the deep end of that, uh, what we were trying to do was treat the intraday movement of price in the same way that a frog moves. Moments of peace and quiet, explosive moves to the next lily pad, pause, refresh, reset, and a series of jumps, sometimes up, sometimes down, and finding that burst activity. Uh, so once we had had done that, we started to learn how we could begin to reduce the size of the frog box so that we could expand the available move and, and learned how much we could tune that and uh, to find the best trade off between signal versus noise. So that's been an ongoing process probably for 10 or 15 years, but it, it is still foundational to the way we approach framing the intraday trades is what we the frog box led us to the idea of what we call the minimum manageable risk box. And so now I get paid as a trader to decide how small can I make that risk box at critical state turning points so that if I take the position that price is moving and then it reverses against me, I never take more than a one R loss to use the tharp thing where whatever the size of my original risk box was how can i how small can i make that and still never take more of a loss than that box so there's got to be some technical signal that gets me out plus slippage and if i can manage that 
then I can I can say that I have been able to um, identify a manageable risk. I can then express the size of the move that's available as a multiple of that box. Now, if I know my minimum manageable risk box on that time frame, I can then tell you on an average move if that's tradable or not for me, if I see a price signal. When you combine that with a critical state, now suddenly you have the ability to go in either direction with larger than normal moves. And that seems to be the secret sauce for me is being able to combine that rigorous statistical framework with identifying moments of compound critical states uh, and then just having enough targets to choose from so that I always have something to do. And I've learned to not predict, not have a directional bias. Uh, I've learned to take the emotional loss of the complete trade at the moment of entry so they don't have to have any worry about, am I going to win or am I going to? No, I just experience the emotional loss. The minute I put the trade on, so there I go again, throwing my money away. Now that I get over that, any exit that's better than a loss of the whole position is is still a positive feeling for me. So I've learned to incorporate my monkey nature and my emotions uh, in that way. And that allows me to be systematic. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, that's a, um, assuming that the trade is a loss right out of the gate is a, is a nice way of lowering your expectation and then being surprised. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, it's so, like buying a lottery ticket. I put a buck down, I buy a lottery ticket. I've, I'm never getting that dollar back. Nice. So I just, uh, I just accept that fact. Oh, I won something. That's anything better any any part of that dollar I get back is is a good day at work. Gotcha. So, yeah. Well, one thing I like about the frog boxes in in particular, and this is something that I I always take away from from your work, is um you know it's that it's the st statistical framework around that intraday range as a measure of volatility, which is similar but distinct from something like an ATR, and you can kind of use the two in con in concert together, but you know. It's, uh, it's, it's a nice way of trying to determine, you know, what is a normal amount of volatility for some product that maybe you've never traded before, right? When you get in there, right. you can look at an ATR or you can look at a frog box, which, you know, the standard deviation of that intraday yeah. range. And um, it's just a nice way of normalizing risk when you don't have yeah. a, a, another way of coming up with what, what should a normal amount of volatility for this particular thing be. Yeah, there's nothing there's nothing objectively true or deep about it. It's simply a construct that we can use an assumption in order to proceed on to a manageable decision. And that's all it ever has to be. So I don't get this emotional connection to this idea that this trade must be right because I use statistics and I predict. No, it's simply a way to get through the chaos and the noise of the markets to frame reasonable trades that are manageable by humans in either direction and that allow us to, to get on with the business. Over. So um, if you were I, to- I saw a question on there, Massimo asked, is it possible to see some charts? We wanted to try to avoid that. But if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, there's a thousand charts <laughs> from the last thousand days. The sniper trade of the day, we highlight one trade and you can see it from setup to execution in implementation, uh, there's a thousand examples there, just free to free to see. Yeah, good good spot. Yeah, so thanks, Massimo. And yeah, like you said, there's there's plenty of stuff available out there on YouTube for that. Um, the um, one other thing that I thought might be interesting from uh, from our our audience point of view is is some of your work on MACD. Um, yeah. And so you know you've got the, the idea of MACD seasonality. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. So one of the things that happens over time when you're a tinkerer, like you and I, we start yeah. monkeying around and adding more things and more things, and it becomes hard to teach and hard to see. And the cost of decision making is extreme. And so living in Kansas, as I do, near to cornfields, uh, I, I took the the same regression lines that I'm using to frame in detail in the price region. And I just make that a moving average 
convergence divergence indicator, but I'm using those moving regression lines. And that really smooths out the large ocean waves. You can really see that next higher order trend. And so we, we started thinking this in terms of agriculture, that the zero, it turns out that when you use those regression lines and the 10 and the 30, and you draw the zero line, every time that MACD goes below the zero line, and you look up at price, something significant just happened and it's not good. It's breaking down. And so when the MACD line is below the zero line and sinking, we just think of that as the winter. It's bad, getting worse, no hope in sight. And it's gonna continue to be winter until it isn't. And then the first hint of, well, it's not failing so much anymore. And those regression lines and moving averages start flattening out a little bit that slope starts going up in the spring until it gets to the zero line. Now in the spring, you wanna be planting, but carefully, cause sometimes old man winter will come back. So you wanna take a cautious but methodical approach to planting seeds in the spring. And when it gets into the summer and everything's growing and it feels easy, you're already in the position and you can start thinking about managing the crops. And then at the peak, when everybody's happy, and it starts rolling over, it automatically visually triggers you to start thinking about harvest and putting something away for the winter. Now, sometimes you get a summer, fall, summer, and that happens in grinding bull markets and everything is right. up and to the right. You see that summer, fall, summer, and now that second season is a MACD signal that, yeah, you can plant another crop where you can add to positions because it had a chance to fail, but it did not. So the simplifying lens of the MACD allows you to make rapid sense of what's going on in the price action, which sometimes can, you know, be overwhelming if you get too many indicators. So the, so the seasonality of the MACD has been a very healthy, health, healthy guide helpful guide to us. You can put that on the market itself. And then if you're trading things that are correlated to that market, that market seasonality now starts giving you insights about some of the, maybe the derivative trades or the subordinate trades. Hey, uh, the market just went from spring to summer. Maybe I can afford to be a little more growth oriented with tech. Oh, market just went into the winter. Be very careful about those speculative growth things. Maybe don't go all in on those. Maybe use the market condition and the seasonality to start influencing some of that asset allocation between competing systems. And I, I know that's something you're working hard on too, is figuring out how to blend those power tools together and, and to create meta systems. And that's some work we've done together to start, you know, uh, trying to smooth out that equity curve over. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's well, one of one of the things I, I get to say is that from from working with you and tinkering with these things for for so many years, it's, um, you know, we get to take things like some of the concepts of you know, combining the RLs and some of the ideas behind PSAR that we've not talked about yet today. Uh, we've, yeah. we've come up with the PRX system that, you know, that is heavily right. influenced by all of your uh, all of your sort of underlying work. Right. And um uh, and, you know, a really simple system that does really well. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention to you as well was, you know, you, you started talking about market classification a bit. And I thought that the yep. guys at the STA here might just be curious to hear about the, yep. the broad market classifications that you use. Um, yeah. So, so I, I see we got about six minutes, so I'll try to be brief. And in, that's not natural behavior for me, but I'll try. <laughs> so I started thinking about market classification when I was working with uh, Dr. Tharp. And the idea was that if you could get the market classification correct, then you could pick a system that should work in that. Where that starts to break down is that you start thinking that a generic market classification could work for any kind of a system. I came to the position that you need a personalized market classification that is tuned to the system that you're using so that it gives you early warning about changing points, but also gives you some comfort that you can stay in that thing while that season is going on. I then moved on to the position where if you have enough non-correlated systems, it turns out that the results that they are generating form a composite picture of the market 
And the kind of market that you're actually in with precision is the kind of market that gives you the results that you're in. So this leads you to always taking the signals for every system that you've tested. And then on the basis of its performance, it's either in tune or not in tune with what the market is currently yielding. So never discard a system. Always run it and then decide separately how much assets to put onto it. And that gives you kind of a composite market classification. And the only purpose they even have in market classification is to give you a shortcut to making risk and reward decisions and which sec which uh, uh, which system to favor over the other. So if you can go directly to a statistical performance curve of each system, in essence, you've created a personally tuned market classification, and then you can just stop listening to talking heads and say, well, we're in a bull market. Well, I'm a day trader. What do you mean prices over the two? And it has no meaning to me at all. The only time I'm interested in the 200 day moving average is when price is right on top of it within a couple percentage points, like because we know the that year, the, the, size, the size of the moves that it makes on a daily basis when it's near the 200 day moving average are relatively large. That's why you get those sideways choppy moves. You get large daily moves, but no follow through. Well, that's perfect for a day trader because then I'm not missing the overnight swing trade. I'm just in, I get a large move, I'm out and I sleep well. So I love the market noodling around at the 200 day moving average with a sense of directionlessness and purposelessness. I, that's my prime time. Yeah. So in a sense, what, I, what I've come to believe and act on is that market classification important but you should think very carefully about what it's doing for you and how it's adding value to the decisions you make about what system to trade and which systems to prefer given the way that you trade. So um, that, that's what I, that's what I want to say about that here as we run up on the time. Yeah. So we can, we can run over a little bit if you are able to. Um, and, oh yeah, uh, I got time. Um, and it's really just, I, I wanted to, um, I wanted to think a little bit sort of like big picture down the little picture and give people an idea of where where you tend to focus your time the most because it sounds to me like you started out you know during your sort of career days you know during army days where it would have had to have been longer term systems and then yeah. you've gone sort of like lower and lower as as time has gone yeah. on and these days i think you found yourself primarily trading intraday and then maybe into swing is that how you describe it yeah that's fair when, when i first started i would say if you think of three buckets uh long-term buy and hold or core uh swing where i'm holding two to ten days and then pure intraday uh when i first started back in the 80s and then through the 90s i was probably 90 percent core and slowly 10% into swing trading around the internet bubbles and some of those um, explosive bulls and then grinding bulls. I started, ex I meant maybe 50% core, 40% swing, 10% day where I am now. And probably for the last 15 years, now that I have more time on my uh, hands and I don't deploy as much, uh, I'm probably 20% core, you know, that long-term buy and hold and adjust it once a month. Yeah. 40% of capital in the swing trade. So I'm planning to hold that position overnight, but rotating, rotating inventory uh, every two to 10 days kind of on a trade by trade basis. So there's sort of a constant manufacturing cycle. And then 40% purely intraday. And that, what that 40% allows me to do is take advantage of short-term intraday moves. I can add to a swing trade position that's already open and working intraday. That's the easiest one of all. And we call that core and turbo. So I've got a long position in Tesla. For, I, I'm not long Tesla right now, but if I were, I could have a swing trade in Tesla and then intraday Tesla's leading the way. I can put a turbo intraday position on, take that off. And now if I had to, I could put, I can use that 40% to make a hedge of the overall portfolio. And now I can, I can normalize my overnight risk when the market's in a critical state. 
So it turns out for me that the way to get a smoother equity curve is to be about 20% long-term buy and hold, 40% swing, 40% intraday. And as I as I make money out of the shorter term, it just kind of flows over into the longer term and grows that part of the portfolio. So that I'm I'm taking uh, taking heat off the engine and putting it into the into the cargo. So uh, for me, that that works out pretty well. It, it's just a uh, a way for me to sleep at night with my risk averse nature. Uh, but that's been a that's been a steady evolution over time you know, to prefer one or the other. And what I found was that the more I read about other people's strategies for, I just, the dumber I felt. And I just had to find out what worked for me and my, my risk tolerance and time frames and skill sets over. So that, that's the direction I've, I've taken for blending systems, if I can say it that way. Over. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, guys, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to throw it into the chat box or even better into the Q and A box there. Um, I was hoping that, you know, I, you've been through a lot of experience and market experience and, uh, mm -hmm. and you come up with things that work for you, but I'm sure that things didn't always work for you. So, cool. um, could you, yeah. could you talk a bit about some of the things that didn't work or, or maybe just how you, how you got over that, how yeah. you deal with failure or. Yeah. Or... Well, I mean, the, uh, you know, my moment of existential threat my existential moment was when, you know, my dad who trusted me beyond all reason, uh, I had his entire retirement account in a position because I thought it was going to go up tomorrow. And then I realized as soon as the market closed, said, well, I've got a hundred percent of his more than a hundred percent of his retirement in that position. And I couldn't sleep the rest of the night. And w what I learned was, that I have to make long-term decisions based on my pessimistic nature. I have an optimistic mind, a pessimistic mind, and sort of the rational engineer mind in the middle. And the young, dumb, aggressive mind is the one that uh, gives every trader, every idea, the benefit of the doubt. And I can imagine a world in which it might work. And there's my impulse to trade. The, pessimistic mind knows I'm everything I do is going to be wrong. And, and, and then the one in the middle, this engineer is the guy that's trying to put things systems together. Well, what I had to learn was that every important decision I've ever made had to go through the lens of the pessimistic mind and be satisfied that I understood the maximum adverse consequence. What is the worst thing that could possibly happen? And then if I can live with that, then I could proceed. So I had to come to a appreciation of how these different feelings or internal minds were affecting the decisions I was making. And that's why I became a uh, systematic trader. So I had to offload all of that bouncing back and forth in the emotions to get into the systematizing. And, and when I did that and I had standard risk per trade, and standard patterns and learn to let go and learn not to jump in. Here's, here's the best exercise I ever did, I think. And that is find a trade that you absolutely love in the symbol you absolutely love and get every screen and filter as positive. You're not taking any shortcuts and then get your perfect entry signal and then don't take the trade and then watch it win and learn to live with that and feel good about the guy that made money on it. If you can let your best idea go and not sweat it, then it should be easier for you to not take shortcuts and not to listen to your monkey mind. I think that was the most important uh, lesson learned was not so much this system versus that system, but really to accommodate the internal dialogue and the emotional nature of trade. I don't try to eliminate the monkey. The monkey is the source of my um, inspirations and intuitions. Most of them don't work, but some of them do. And so that was sort of uh, finding a way to cherish and accommodate that helped me with, with risk. Um, I see a question in the uh, peers asks, um, the linear regression, I, I would start with the 10 period linear regression 
as the fast regression line so that you can have a slow regression line of 30. And the reason I start with, and you work backwards, the 30 period regression line, you need 30 data points in statistics to begin to say anything sensible from a statistical perspective. Now, the Bollinger Band is defaults to 20, so you're leaning forward, but you're, it's not pure 30. So if the 30 is my long-term moving average, then the fast one, I want one-third of that. It should turn fast enough so that when it turns and I can get an entry, I still have two-thirds of the time left for the 30 to run around. So I look at those in terms of pairs, and so I find that the 10-period linear regression is a really good proxy for price. And then the size of the tails is simply the noise. And if you can account for the noise, you're interested in the, what's the maximum move away from the regression line in the, in the look back period. You can now start thinking in a statistical way with the regression line. And then that will lead you to the uh, re, um, uh, essentially moving regression lines or least squares moving averages. Uh, Investopedia has a nice treatment of uh, least squares moving averages. Um, I, you know, the best the best book on statistics I, was from the learning company, Michael Starbird from University of Texas, who basically walks you through how statistics work. And uh, it was, I've never looked back. That was such a good book and such a good course that I can recommend it. Um, and the key thing is not to over invest your confidence in the statistics. You got to remember that financial markets are non normally distributed. And so the fat tails of markets will kill you. Uh, the book is um, Michael Starbird, S T A R B I R D. And it was introduction to statistics at the learning company, um, which you can, I mean, you can get a uh, Amazon prime channel and, and get that course there, but that's a, that's a good one. Um, any basic uh, book on statistics will, will treat regression and regression lines, and then um, everything else is application. Over. So, yeah, lo loads of good stuff in there, um, and quite a few questions on, on regression lines, actually. So um, somebody else was, um, Satyam, was asking, what's the best website to learn about linear regression? Uh, or or fractals in the stock market. So I don't know. I would. Yeah, I would. I, probably... would, uh, I, I think Investopedia. I, I wouldn't <clears throat> worry about fractals uh, in a technical level, because there's a lot of guys that use like turbulence theory and aerodynamics, and they get into fractals. And you can go off the deep end on that. It's sufficient, in my view, to just recognize that price action on a time frame is similar to time action on another time frame and that robust patterns that are keyed towards price action uh, are fractal and that they the standard patterns work on multiple time frames because they are simply reflecting the psychology of the people who are reacting to price so uh i wouldn't go off the deep end on fractals and then investopedia uh, as a fine little free uh work on linear regression and how regression lines can work. Um, uh, and, and that's where I, I would start with that. And then if you if you get stuck on that, just send me an email and I'll, I may be able to point you at some maybe better resources. I, I don't want to overload you with with too many things like that, because then we end up start chasing the tool. And we got to remember that the tool is simply leveraged to make better decisions. And, and if I was going to say a non-trading essay to read, find the Harvard Business Review uh, article from 2006, which says, stop planning, make better decisions. And it helps us think about the point of all the work that we're doing with technical analysis is not to get precision for the sake of precision or truth. No, we're just trying to make better decisions in a chaotic market. And so don't let the best become the enemy of the good. And so um, regression lines are a, a way to begin to get an edge. But like every other tool, it has a time and place. Over. Uh, there's a quick question here from um, from uh, Ionet, which is really about 
fundamentals versus technicals. So he, he's asking essentially, or do you, do you consider fundamentals at all? Or are you purely looking at technicals or, or price, I suppose we could say? I, I'm really looking at technicals and price only. Uh, my, my personal opinion, having taught in MBA courses and taught at financial valuation of companies at the doctoral level, is garbage in, garbage out. There's, in my view, there's no actionable information that you can glean that gives you an advantage over the millions of MBAs with computers who are analyzing the stock that you're going to trade. You can't possibly independently get an edge on fundamentals that's not already been seen by tens of thousands of analysts. So I, I just don't, that's not a game where I, the individual trader with my little PC, can hope to have an edge over fundamental analysis. Then if you say the quality of the information going in is worse than it ever has been because companies are getting increasingly sued for giving false pretenses, that they're watering down all that stuff. So I, I don't see that fundamentals give you any advantage as a trader. Now, maybe long term, but even there, I find that the movement of money between asset classes is a far better predictor of long-term robustness than any individual amount of fundamental analysis. So that's just a personal, a personal belief and an approach and a stance. Uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, and then the shorter term that you are, it's even less valuable because in the short run, as you know, it's a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. So I'm 65. I don't have time to be weighing fundamentals. You know, I've only got another hundred years of, of this ahead of me. So I got to get on with it, you know. Fair enough. Great. Um, there's so much more that we could talk about. And, but I wanted to give people a, um, a, an yeah. idea of, uh, of, of at least some, some of the ideas and some of the concepts. And now what, I, what I'd like to highlight, I think, for, for people, for anybody who's maybe peaked, we've peaked their interest today, is, um, well, your website, tortoise, tortoisecapital.net. Um, there's lots of resources on there. Many of them are free, I think. Um, and you know what we haven't even talked about today is the the daily report. <clears throat> Ken does a daily report every every day, uh, which is just chock full of um, mainly statistically based uh, number crunching, which basically pulls the market and finds these compound critical states. Um, also, just looks at just the general market condition highlights all kinds of other tools that we haven't had a chance to talk about today, but are mainly yep. statistically based and all aimed around looking at the market from different sort of aspects and lenses. Um, and I, you know, I would, I would encourage everyone to just to have a look, have a look there. Um, yeah. The and, website has samples. There was a, I saw a question in there about uh, advice on dollar cost averaging when entering the market. Here's how I think about that. Uh, if you're looking to first get into a market, it's you have a bucket of money that is moving from one risk profile to a new risk profile. Whatever market you're getting into represents some quantifiable volatility and risk. So you should look at, in my view, what is the risk profile of that money where it is to what it's moving into? So I just recently moved money from uh, a growth account into uh, inflation protected treasuries. So that is a lower risk profile. So I don't need to mark, I don't need to dollar cost average into treasuries. I can just move the entire radioactive pile of growth money and put it in a lower risk category and then start getting the long-term exposure uh, to, to treasuries. If I was going in the other direction, I think in order to just calm your mind, it, I, I normally just I, I normally just cut it into four chunks, you know, and if, if like if I'm doing swing trading, I just cut it into four chunks and each week add one more chunk so that over the course of four weeks, I've kind of added in, uh, I've moved that money into a new risk category, got something like a blended insight. I don't know if that works in the long run one way or the other, it always will vary but it makes me sleep at night better 
Uh, that, that's what, what I would say there. I see uh, Sun, Sunit has asked, better to look at MACD on daily or weekly? Well, if your MACD is based on those regression lines, like I suggested, it turns out that a daily chart gives you sufficient warning to get the early turns, but without so much noise that you get smoked out of it too soon. But it also works on a weekly chart. Like if you were using weekly charts to advise your long-term positioning, you could look at weekly charts with MACD and use that to guide your monthly asset reallocation. So uh, so there is information available on whatever time frame you're using it in order to smooth it out. Like I use MACD intraday on one minute and three minute charts because when it makes turning points from winter to spring, I need to know that because there's a potential important turning point ready to go. So the default on MACD 912 and 26, I use a I use 10, 30, and 5. I have been experimenting with 4, 30, and 5. And both of those are much improved over the default 9, 12, and 26. Over. Uh, a question was, what works best, uh, swing trades or intraday with linear? Uh, the linear regressions are fractal. And so the decisions and the patterns and the framing is identical on both time frames. I find it uh, satisfactory in both time frames. Over. Excellent. This has been this has been great for me because I because you're picking up all of the questions. <laughs> well, it's uh, on my screen, you know. I just... <laughs> yeah, I know. No, that's great. No, thank you very much. Um, so Piers is asking the those MACD numbers again. So uh, would you mind repeating yeah. it once more, just for Piers? Yeah. Uh, so I use two forms of this. One is the uh, uh, fast moving average of ten, then thirty and then a five period smoothing. So 10, 30, and five. And then I also am uh, working with four as the fast, 30 as the slow, and a smoothing factor of five. And, uh, and I find both of those effective uh, to get the seasonal changes proper. Because yeah, in the winter time, I either wanna be short or just out of the market, but I need to get alert that it's becoming the spring and it's starting to thaw. That's all I need the MACD to be able to do is to begin to shift from pure defense to incrementing in and uh, and that both of those uh, work just fine. Yeah, so how and when to take profits. You can put statistics on your performance of a of a rules based system and you can say that on a, for example, a standard swing trade that lasts on average five days that makes 8%. If you study enough of those, you can say, what is the ab what is the boundary of the normal gain? Is it eight plus or minus two? If so, when it gets above 10%, you now know that you are in the region of abnormal profits. And so now I wanna make sure that my, my exit doesn't give back too much of an abnormal profit because I wasn't entitled to believe I could get that. So if I've got an abnormally large profit, I want to take more care protecting the abnormal gain. So as you start thinking about uh, exit strategies in this way, you begin to distinguish between normal and abnormal conditions and it allows you to, uh, to get more from the best trades because you give back less. Um, and then as long as you have a good strategy for re-entry or reversal, then you realize it doesn't cost me anything to get back in. So I don't have to worry about missing out the move that begins after I exit. So when you combine those two factors, no one yet is statistically abnormal gains and have a plan for re-entry or reversal, now you won't get psychologically tricked into staying too long out of fear. You can you can simply reframe the trade and now you are free to make the uh, the exit decision that you want. Uh, let me just say before we get, you know, before we get out of here, over the course of a long trade, of a long-term trade, you might end up making 10 decisions 
uh, about how to adjust your stop. You have a, a decision to get in, that's one. You have a decision to get out, that's two. If that was rule-based, then you didn't even have to make the decision. The exit hits itself. So you got those two. Now, along the way, as you're adjusting and adjusting and adjusting, you might make eight adjustments to where your stop is. So over, over the course of 10 decisions, only one of them had anything to do with entry, and that was a crapshoot anyhow. <laughs> so if you were ever going to spend time improving your decision, it should be on the eight decisions in the middle about how to incrementally adjust your stop so that you are satisfied that it is properly balancing the conservative nature and the aggressive nature. Because you have one little devil telling you, get out, get out. The other one is saying, stay in, stay in. How do you reconcile those? You have to have a rule. So in order to balance those without driving yourself nuts, you should spend your time on managing and adjusting your exits until the trade rules kick you out of the trade. That's far more important in my view than trying to perfect the entry. A long move, you can get in in different, in different places. Over. Excellent stuff, Ken. Thank you. Um, oh, we got one more question. Let's maybe maybe we can hit this one, and then uh, I wanted to talk about creativity briefly. Um, do you see yeah. Cesar's question? Sure. Yeah, I see Heiken Ashi now. Uh, mm -hmm. Our forex. Now we got a group of guys that are robo trading forex with scripts uh, under the direction of one of my one of my peer instructors who just retired from the army, Dr. Eric Morrison. And they love that hike and ashy and it's working for them. I don't, I don't personally use it because I can see what price is doing without all the extra colors. Uh, but they're making good use of hike and ashy and it makes absolute sense uh, for those moves. And I think, I think there's an edge in there. If you have an, if you have a lens and you really understand it, you can make it work for you against all the people that are just monkeying around with it. So pick your lens, become expert at it, and then you should have an advantage. So that, that's what, that's what I, I don't personally use it, but I see our guys in the chat room and the Forex group doing it a lot. So it's got to work. Excellent, Ken. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to be respectful of your time and, and the time of our audience as well. So we should really look to, to wrap it up. Um, I wanted to let people know about how they can how they can learn more. So tortoisecapital.net, I think uh, Katie has yeah. put it up in the in the chat room there. Um, there's also a um, uh, you're very active on Patreon, um, but you're yeah. you'll I think you could probably find everything from tortoisecapital.net. And uh, you yeah. know if if people are interested in you know learning more about how you how you trade, how you think about systems, how they can get involved with systems. Is there is there anywhere else that they should they should go and check? Well, out? I would uh, I would just point you at the uh, at the YouTube channel. I think it's Ken Long. It's YouTube.com. Ken Long Tortoise. Can't miss it. Yeah. Uh, there's there's about seven thousand videos on there. <laughs> uh, the ones from the last month, I have been taking special care to demonstrate a daily sniper trade of the day, which is an intraday application of what we're doing but also the a swing trade portfolio where i'm using exactly the same patterns with 30 minute candles on a portfolio of about 10 or 15 different uh instruments some etfs and some stocks and it just shows that this stuff is fractal and it talks you through the risk reward and some of the big ideas and and i just post that there every day and then i review the daily report in that same video and they last anywhere from 30 minutes to about an hour and you put it on 1.5 speed and you won't have to listen to my voice so much. <laughs> but I, I would say be, the tortoisecapital.net has plenty of good ideas. Plus I think of even more interest would be, look, if you're a trader uh, or if you're a teacher, just show me your students. And so there's a bunch of briefing and you got one on there too, I would point out a pretty nice one. Uh, and it just shows what guys that are applying this in their own life are doing in different ways. You'll find plenty of goodies on tortoisecapital.net and on the YouTube channel. And if it's of interest, you know, you, you can find us and, and do more uh, to your heart's content. So that's where I would start, tortoisecapital.net 
and then the uh, YouTube channel, uh, Ken Long Tortoise. So that's what I would do. Fantastic. Now, I, I just wanted to briefly touch on creativity because I just finished a course mm -hmm. with you, uh, which is like a 30, a 30 week course on, on. Oh, creativity. that was painful. <laughs> no, it was great. It was, uh, but you know, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a different thing, creativity for traders and trying to get yeah. to try to dive into, um, you know, how do you, how do you kind of like tap into to something different? And it's, um, yeah. I, I found it super useful. Would you, could you give us just 30 seconds sure. on, uh, on that? Yeah. So uh, the army is concerned with getting every brain into the fight uh, in order to find the creative insights that work and can be scaled uh, to make a difference on the battlefield. So this is high risk and we take it very, very seriously. So we've, uh, I've been partnering with a professor Angus Fletcher from Ohio State, who is the world's leading authority on story science. And together, we put together a uh, creativity research project with human subjects, and we evaluated his approach to teaching creativity. It's really unleashing the inherent natural creativity in our evolutionary adaptive brain. So the idea is that what has made us the top of the food chain was this adaptive brain, which uses stories and language and communication uh, to communicate, to imagine a future, to create tribes that work together. We get educated out of that and we try to learn just rules. So the Fletcher treatment is a way to tap into that natural storytelling and unleash our natural creativity. Uh, he wrote a best-selling book on that. I said, I need something that soldiers will read. So he wrote a book, which has become another bestseller that has 30 small <clears throat> chapters with a one page uh, reading and an experiential learning, um, exp uh, experiential learning uh, exercise. So we use that now in the army to increase our creativity. I took that book and then I added 30 traders lessons that were complimentary, which is the course you went through. So I teach a 30 week course that does a Fletcher lesson, my lesson, you suffer through it for a week and then you come into a true story circle and we just talk about what the big aha moments were for us, what the insights were. And then it's like literally popcorn. As we start kicking that around everybody's insights about these ideas, you inevitably get these extraordinary insights out of nowhere and you benefit from this collaborative learning environment. Well, the entire army is adopting this approach to teaching creativity as you and I saw with 20 different traders, this thing is transformative in its power. We got more ideas in 30 weeks than we could figure out in 30 years, to be honest. So um, I'm adopting that approach to storytelling for the army, for traders, for my soccer club. And it just really seems to be tapping into something foundational. We're using it across the special forces community uh, with the Danish leadership project that I'm working on with the head of their FBI, just everywhere we go, this approach to creativity is powerful and uh, it's uh, transformative. So that's, that's, you'll see some samples of that stuff on that tortoise capital and on the, um, uh, the YouTube where we've made some of that uh, available. It's uh, it's profound. Over. Yeah. Thank you. No, I found it really, really useful. And uh, you know, it stemmed off a bunch of, of different projects for uh, for us over on our side uh, as well. Yep. And so all of that is still sort of in play and in a way still, still being digested. So the uh, we've not seen all of the fruits of that effort yet. Oh yeah. So, more coming. So yeah, certainly more coming. Well, just from the 30 week course that we did and the people that were in there, we've started four new businesses, designed five new trading courses, and and help three people retire just in the last eight months and they were not taking that course in order to do that that was just the natural consequence of the power of that course so you know you you come to learn a little thing and suddenly your whole life it gets uh yeah uh, uh transformed it's uh, staggering Excellent. Well, Ken, I think we we really ought to probably wrap it up there. We've gone over yep. by a fair amount, which I which I sort of expected, but I think it was worthwhile anyway. That's going to um, happen. 
<laughs> well, thank you so much for for sharing with us all of your insights. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I'm so pleased we got we got you over here, uh, you know, on the STA today. Um, to all of you, you know, out there as well. Um, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of nice messages coming through on chat. If you haven't seen them, Ken, so lots of thanks coming. Oh through. yeah, you guys are way too kind. Thank you so <laughs> much. You really treated me as a welcome guest, and I genuinely appreciate the time and attention. And if I can be a service to you, just send me an email and we'll we'll try to help. Great. Well, uh, okay, a quick brief on next month. So March, we've got an in-person meeting. So we're back at One More Gate Place for anybody that can make it there. Uh, we're going to be um, confirming the speaker shortly, um, but yeah, it's, you, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, so, so come join us there for, for some drinks. Uh, and then in April, we're going to have a normal um webinar based meeting a bit like a bit like tonight's with ken um and that's a week before the 18th of april where we've got that technicals to trading conference coming up so you really ought to check that one out that is going to be one of the best bangs for your buck that you can get i think a full day it's an in-person or a zoom i would always come to the in-person because you get to meet and greet and talk to all the guys and network and we're and you'll have dinner not not dinner but um lunch and drinks and uh and just great, great chat. So once again, please accept my thanks, Ken. Thank you so much for, for coming along tonight. Good night to everybody else out there. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, everyone.